Attention, ceci est l'intégrale de l'interview utilisée dans ma vidéo sur les oursins diadèmes aux Caraïbes. Si tu n'as pas vu ce documentaire, je t'invite vraiment à aller le voir en premier. Puis, si tu veux plus de détails, eh bien, tu pourras revenir ici pour regarder l'interview complète. Mais va d'abord voir le documentaire en entier. Tiens, je te mets le lien en haut là. Voilà, juste là. Parce que ça, c'est juste un bonus. D'ailleurs, euh, c'est pour ça que c'est dans la playlist euh, bonus, du coup. Hein voilà. Allez, bon visionnage. Alors là, je te parle depuis euh, SIF, la Fondation de Conservation de Saba, et je suis en bonne compagnie, je suis en compagnie d'Alvin, qui va justement nous expliquer en fait la maladie dont je t'ai parlé précédemment, euh, qui a touché toutes les Caraïbes, il va nous expliquer ce qui s'est passé, et puis aussi, bah, le plus intéressant de cette vidéo, il va nous expliquer tout le programme de conservation et de réintroduction euh, des oursins dans l'île de Saba, et puis plus généralement dans les Caraïbes. Hi Alvin So, okay. thanks for inviting me and thanks for making this interview. Can you uh, introduce a bit yourself to the people who see the video? Sure. So my name is Owen Hukema. I work for University of Applied Science van Halarestein in the Netherlands. And I'm here on SEBA in the Dutch Caribbean. And together with the SEBA Conservation Foundation, we investigate uh, why the sea urchins, Diadema antelarum, are not returning on our coral reefs. So, as I explained in the beginning of the video, the area in Caribbean uh, suffer of a lack of sea urchin. But why, why did the population disappear? Right. The diadema, they were the most important herbivore on the Caribbean coral reefs. And before uh, 1982, 1983, there were 5 till 10 per square meter on most of the coral reefs. And then in 1982, a disease started and it decimated the population. Within one year, 95% of the population died off. 95%? Right, that's dramatic, right? Yeah, that's massive. And uh, up till now, so more than 30 years later, uh, the population still did not recover. Why were the origin of this sickness? Yeah, so the disease started uh, right at the Panama Channel. So we think it came through the, uh, from the Pacific through the Panama Channel and then uh, went with the current uh, through the Caribbean. Why the effect on the reef was so dramatic? Because we have other species of animal who can also eat the grass, isn't it? What other, what is the effect? Uh, they think what happened was that before the sea urchins became the most important herbivore, the other, the parrot fish and the surgeon fish were already overfished. So they could not do the job anymore. And then the diadema died off, which could not do the job anymore. And the result was that the reefs became overgrown with, with algae. The coral reef basically shifted from a coral dominated system mm -hmm. towards an algae dominated system. Mm. And that doesn't allow the new colony of coral to settle down. So algae do not only overgrown the corals, but they also take away all the bare substrate. So that was a very important function of the diadema, creating bare rock where juvenile corals could settle on. And that doesn't happen anymore. So the juvenile corals have no place to settle. And that reduces the resilience of the coral reefs, the ability to recover from other disturbances, for example, hurricanes or bleaching events. Okay, so now we know a bit more about the sickness, but um, could you explain to us what you're actually starting and working on in SEBA about this urchin? Right, so uh, within our uh, diadema project, uh, we try to restore the diadema population. So we want to find out why they are not recovering naturally, And if we know that, then we can work on an uh, intervention or an invention. We can develop something that will restore the diadema population. Uh, the first step of the project is that we want to uh, see what is the natural recruitment of diadema larvae around the island. Mm. I'm sorry to cutting you, but I think it's uh, what we already did on a video on vlog with Ayumi some months ago. It's the same, yeah, it's yeah. the same project. And what we try to do there is find out how many larvae uh, are there in the water column. So the interesting thing is that we found uh, a high number of juvenile sea urchins on reefs where there are no adults whatsoever. So apparently the potential for recovery is there, but somehow they do not settle on the natural reef, or they do, but then they do not survive until adulthood, because we don't see the adults. For example, what we saw um, on the area we call uh, Uh, diadema city, mm -hmm. where we have like a very clean rocks everywhere because of a lot of diadema. So we have one area here on Seba, we call it diadema city, where the diadema population did recover. So we have high number of diadema there again, and you see the difference with other locations. So 
uh, the algae are grazed away, you, won't, you almost won't find any uh, macroalgae or smaller turf algae there. But more interesting, it has the highest number of juvenile corals of all the reefs around, the, around Seba. And um, no, that's, that's, that's it. <laughs> the end. That's very interesting. That's really it was a previous video. Mm -hmm. Something is actually like positive. It's yes, we don't have sea urchin, unfortunately, but we have larvae. Mm -hmm. How do we know that? So we put uh, larval collectors, pieces of uh, artificial turf that we put in a water column uh, all around Seba. And what we discovered last year is that we have a high number of settlements of juvenile sea urchins on the plates, which is very positive because that means that there's potential for natural recovery. You just came back from the first dive, isn't it? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what have we done? What have you done on this first dive? Uh, what we've done is uh, we uh, collected five samples, uh, which are actually artificial turf, a uh, patch of artificial turf, because we found out that this is a really good method to uh, collect diadema uh, settlers, so juvenile sea urchins that uh, live as a larvae in the water column and then uh, it's time for them for them uh, metamorphosis and they're going to settle somewhere and they apparently like this substrate uh, so we have all these um, pieces of artificial mm -hmm. turf around the island yeah. and we want to find out which reefs are most have most settlers the, 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 they do not settle uh, at the same rate the whole year mm -hmm. so we want to find out what are the months that are most important for settlement. Mm -hmm. So we're doing it for a whole year. Okay, and uh, this afternoon you will go to show to us something else, isn't right. it? Right, yeah, because we found out that there's actually a lot of uh, diadema settlers in the waters around Seba, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of uh, adult sea urchins. So somewhere between being a very small baby sea urchin and an adult, they either get eaten or they do not have enough food. Something is going on there. So what we're going to find out uh, this afternoon or later this morning is um, we're doing an experiment with uh, shelter size. So if, sh if uh, shelter size helps them to survive and not being eaten. Okay, and so um, actually if I understand properly because you told me you're building different size of shorter shell. Yeah, yeah? that's correct. Yeah. So we're building different reefs and they all have a different shelter size. And uh, then we want to see what is the most ideal shelter size for diadema. Now we know we have our larva, and actually we have a lot of larva in it. Uh, but those larva are not going to the reef; mm -hmm. they're, they're not growing. Could you explain to us uh, if it was a surprise or no, and what's your reading of that? Right. So after uh, the die-off, mm -hmm. uh, scientists thought that they would uh, recover immediately because this is a very productive. Animal, they can one animal can produce thousands of eggs, um, and they also can spread over huge distances. So they thought that within months the population would be recovered, but that didn't happen. And now, 30 years later, uh, the population still didn't recover. Okay, so we have the larva, and these larva are not growing. The, or they're not. So there, there could be two things that the uh, uh, diadema. Uh, do not recover on a natural reef because we see them in the larvae traps but we do not see the adults on the reef. It could be that they settle on our larval collectors but not on the reef um, because they miss certain signals. So most of the marine organisms that have a larval phase they are dependent on certain signals from the environment that makes them decide to settle somewhere. So in our lab in Leeuwarden in the Netherlands we're trying to figure out what the signal is for the diadema sea urchin. So what is the cue that makes them settle? And the way we do that, we cultivate them, uh, we produce uh, larvae that are ready to settle, and then we will start adding the different possible cues. So for example, a certain species of algae or uh, water that comes from a tank with adult diadema. And by doing that, we will try to figure out what the signal is that makes them settle. Because if we know that, then we can see if the signal is still around on the natural reefs, and if not, we can uh, edit. We can uh, process the signal into some kind of biodegradable material, for example, concrete or something else, that releases the chemical into the water and makes them settle on in a certain position. 
I think I, it's uh, actually like they are larvae and they need an external environmental effect for transforming the cell from a larva to a sea urchin. Exactly, to complete the metamorphosis into an, from larvae to a sea urchin. Yes. When you're talking about metamorphosis, I'm really thinking about Pokemon, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it could be nice. It's the same, basically. Yeah, it, and it's very um, instant. So within an hour, the, uh, the animal is totally different. It's from a larvae to a sea urchin with small spines. Oh, super cool. Yeah. So that's the project at the moment. Identify um, what kind of uh, spore or environmental effect will start so the growing um, the growing period. Right. And what will be like um, the third part, the last part of the project? Well. Uh, I still will explain the second, no, oh, don't worry sorry. about it. So the, uh, the second thing we're looking into at the moment is survival. So the, uh, the second thing we're looking into at the moment is survival. So it could be that they do settle on the natural reef, so the queue might already be there, but that they do not survive into adulthood because there might be more species eating them, for example, more crabs, tiny fish. So what we're trying to figure out now is what is the best shelter size to make them survive. And I already showed you the cages we have. Mm -hmm. Well, that's to keep the, the diadema in. We provide them with different shelter sizes and we try to find out what increases their survival. In Diadema City, we have the cages to keep the sea urchins in a certain area and then we provide them with a specific shelter size and we try to find out which shelter is ideal for their survival. So each of these cages have a different size of uh, shelter and we check in which one they have, a, they have the biggest uh, surviving rate. Yeah, so each, each cage has a different shelter size and we try, we've, we try to find out in which shelter size they have the highest survival rate. Oh, that's super cool. At the end, when we have this information about uh, the larva evolution, what created that, and when we know, um, and when we know about the shelter design, uh, what, uh, what's the last step, what's the last part of the project? So if we know the signal that makes them settle in a certain place, and we know the ideal shelter size, we want to combine the two in a diadema booster. So the diadema booster is a device you can put on the reef that increases settlement and maximizes survival. And by doing that, we want to restore the diadema populations. First here on Seba, and then also in different places of the Caribbean. So if we restore the sea urchin populations, then uh, that means that uh, corals have a place to settle again, but it also means that the corals that we grow ourselves and that we transplant have a higher chance to survive and to grow because they are not competing with the algae anymore because they will be raised away by the sea urchins. That's a very interesting project. I'm very excited to see where it goes. Uh, but I have a question about that. A project like this, um, how many months or year it took for arriving to the ending? Because many people don't really understand part yeah. of the work. So it, we estimate that it will take us around four years to find out the queue and um, the ideal shelter size and then combine the two in a diadema booster. So the entire diadema project will last about four years. Meanwhile, you're also planning to protect some larva on land for reintroduce a massive amount at the same time, isn't right. it? So, uh, but we do not want to wait that long for restoring the diadema populations. So in our larval collectors, we collect a huge number of small sea urchins at the moment. And what we want to do is we want to put them in tanks on land and then raise them till they are big enough to protect themselves, till they have enough spines. And then we'll put them back on the reef at the same time as we put coral fragments there. So it's a tandem restoration. We restore not only the corals, but also the sea urchins. So they can eat away the algae and protect the coral. Uh, do you have a Actually, some example of reef recovering with a sea urchin or just sea urchin will recover by themselves. 
yeah. uh, in Caroline. Do you have some example of that? Right. Yeah. So the reason we're so excited about this project is that uh, we already saw in a few places what the recovery of sea urchins uh, means for the reef. So there are a couple places around the Caribbean where populations recovered and you immediately saw the effect on the reef. Uh, meaning that there were more juvenile corals, but they also had a higher chance to survive and they grew faster. So the corals shifted back from algae dominated system towards a coral dominated system. So that's transformation again of all of the reef. Right, it will be so important. So if we succeed to do that in other places, uh, yeah, that would be great, of course. I think it's super interesting. Um, I feel like uh, I would love to finish with that because I feel like many people don't really understand the level of interaction between all of the species on a reef. You mm -hmm. know, we are thinking like we're introducing coral, we're making grow, but well, no, wait. If you don't have the sea urchin at the beginning, it will not work. But even for having the sea urchin at the beginning, you need maybe some uh, external uh, factors for having them growing here. Right. So you have to find this kind of factor. It's like a, a crazy, a crazy chain. Yeah, a chain of reaction. Yeah. But at least here uh, we can see the effect in the Caribbean, and we can be positive on the evolution of this project, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we do. So this this is one of the few things that we can do locally to uh, protect the reefs and to uh, give coral a bigger chance to survive and to grow and flourish. That's super interesting. I'm super excited. I hope I will come back here in two or three years for see how it looks now. Yeah, do that. Yeah. Hopefully I can show you a lot of sea urchins around. Please, here. please. I will be very happy to see that. Okay. Thank you so much, Alvin, for your time. Yeah, It was a real pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Euh, bon, ben, je suis très content d'avoir pu te présenter Alvin parce qu'il a pu nous expliquer en fait tout le programme euh, de réimplantation d'oursin et puis surtout ben, les difficultés qui se présentent parce que souvent on a tendance à se dire qu'il suffit de remettre la bestiole et puis ça repart. Ben, en fait, non, il y, a beaucoup de... il y a beaucoup de variables à tenir en compte. Comme toujours, j'aime bien finir sur de belles images, donc je vais te laisser avec des oursins et puis on va se retrouver pour la conclusion. Et encore une fois, je voudrais qu'on remercie Alvin parce que c'est très sympa d'avoir pris euh, pff, au moins deux heures de sa journée juste pour nous. So, once more, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. <rires>